everybody, and welcome to today's edition of the Midday Market Update. It's Tuesday, April 6th, and I'm joined today by a little bit of a different face. We've got Andrew Cox in the house, not just for news, but he's here co-hosting with me today. How are you, Andrew? Thanks for uh, taking Michael Vincent's seat. I am lovely, yes. Filling in for Mike today, he's feeling a little bit under the weather. We wish him a speedy recovery, but definitely here to fill in uh, for his duties. We've got a fantastic show got jam-packed. It is live and interactive as well, so you can, of course, get your comments, questions, and concerns there. And on LinkedIn, we will be uh, watching those closely. But we've got some great guests. We've got Rolf Rexton. He's the VP of Route Advisory Services at Storm Geo. Yep. And we've also got Alan Adler checking in, our Detroit Bureau Chief, talking about some new Class 8 truck orders and how they've changed over the last year and over the last month. Yeah, he's been busy. If you get on FreightWaves.com, <laughs> he's got seemingly two or three articles every day. We'll also talk to him about Trevor Milton, our favorite guy to bash on. He just raked in $50 million <laughs> from selling a couple uh, shares of his uh, Nikola stock. So we'll, we'll talk to Alan about that as well. We've got Nick Austin coming up on the weather, as well as Zach Strickland giving us some sonar insights, and Anthony Smith, our lead economist, also talking about some of the new job openings and the ISM services index. Right, and we've got Andrew filling Michael Vincent's seat, even though you know he can never fill his shoes. They are so, quite big. <laughs> they are quite big shoes. He's definitely right about that. If you guys want to let uh, Michael know that you're wishing him well, make sure that you do that in the LinkedIn comments. I'm sure that he's going to be checking on you to see how well that you're doing. <laughs> but let's see, we've got some, some good headlines, uh, speaking of those jobs that you were talking about, right? That's right. We have a report uh, by the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce that was published in tandem with President Biden's release of the American Jobs Plan last week. It is based on infrastructure related and policy data uh, that, the, that the administration has released over the past year, including the infrastructure plan that Biden rolled out during the campaign. The spokesperson from Georgetown told FreightWaves that nothing in the newest iteration of the bill changes their calculations. So uh, the calculations are, are really good for the trucking industry. The researchers state that if Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure program is enacted, it could put the United States back on a pre-recession job growth uh, trajectory and create and or save 15 million jobs. And here's the kicker for trucking. Transportation and materials moving make up 60% of the infrastructure-related occupations either saved or created by Biden's infrastructure bill, according to the report. We have a table here to show you that you can see the top uh, list being those uh, transportation and materials moving within that category. Jobs for commercial drivers of heavy trucks and light truck delivery drivers would account for roughly uh, 2.8 million jobs in total, which is close to 20% of the 15 million jobs estimated in the report. Geographically speaking, the report says that jobs created or saved do favor the populous coastal states, but that jobs would be spread out across the country with Midwestern states generating roughly 20% and Southeastern 22%. It's going to be a haul for this bill to get passed uh, by the Democrats in, in Congress. Lobbying groups that are even supportive of the infrastructure bill do oppose the way that it is, it is planned to be funded with a corporate tax hike from 21 to 28%. Right. And if you caught both of last week's episodes of Midday Market Update, we had our Freight Waves Washington correspondent, John Gallagher, on. And he gave down a, a really detailed breakdown kind of what that infrastructure plan entailed. And he also seemed kind of bullish on the idea that this was going to be a really tough fight between the both parties in uh, Congress to try and get this passed. It certainly is. The bill does uh, lean to benefit some of the Democratic states. But if you look at one of the big points uh, that was written in this article was that Although the uh, senators and the congressmen that uh, may vote against the bill, their voters may not feel the same way because they will be the exact states that will be benefiting from this. There are a lot of jobs that can be created or saved out of this. Whether it gets passed, we'll be watching very closely over the next few months. Right. It's the idea of caring to your constituents. And someone last week, called, last week on LinkedIn posed a pretty good question to John Gallagher asking how much of that money from the bill would go to outside sources? Like how much of that is going to go to companies that are producing products outside the U.S. to pump in? And he kind of had the idea that Biden is very, very focused on keeping this money in the United States, creating these jobs for folks who have lost those jobs in the last year through the pandemic. So hopefully that'll be kind of that pushing factor on the right side of Congress to get it through. And then he also did mention that Vice President Harris does have that deciding vote in the Senate. So he's watching that to kind of do the push important the the having having vice president uh, harris there to make the deciding vote will, could be important in this battle One, the last thing i'll note on this uh is that the um <laughs> i forgot what i was going to say but <laughs> the uh, the bill that is getting pushed uh it will be difficult to pass but what let's move on to mccormick and company because uh, mccormick and company the world's largest spice company they reported earnings last week and 
they provided an outlook that was favorable, boosted by continued elevated levels of at-home consumption. I know this has been something that you've had trouble with, <laughs> uh, McCormick, the spice company. During the past year, they were surprised by the level of demand they had, and it's been a mixed blessing, but really it's contributed to major supply chain issues, particularly for popular herbs, spices, and recipe mixes. You and I were just speaking offline about the difficulties finding spices, especially around the holiday season, and that's because McCormick temporarily suspended production of some of its products last year to ramp up production of some of its high-velocity, most in-demand uh, in demand products. They say about half of the sus suspended products are back on shelves now, but in keeping with a major trend in the CPG industry over, the, over COVID, the company has rationalized the number of SKUs that it will be producing uh, by a couple hundred units. And it doesn't have plans to return to the same level of SKUs that it had prior to the pandemic. And that's a trend that we're going to see across CPG. I think we're also going to see it across apparel and across many other retail segments. People are really cutting down on what they're offering to kind of maximize the efficiencies of what they have. And they kind of figured out what they can live with and what they can live without during the pandemic. And I'm going to say, I don't know if you're on TikTok, Andrew. Uh, but I downloaded TikTok at the beginning of the pandemic, right? And through the entire first couple months, all that I saw were people baking and making bread and recipes and all this stuff. So it makes total sense that people were without these essential, essential I would call them, spices. You were talking about even at times it was hard to find salt and pepper in stores. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, I remember trying to find garam masala because I wanted to make curry. And it took mm -hmm. me, I think I had ordered online. It took three weeks to get there. Uh, it was unbelievable. Salt and pepper were difficult to find. Luckily, those days seemingly are getting behind us. But the, the days of having all of the kind of niche spices, that mm -hmm. may be a few months ahead of us. And it may never come back. See, and when you've got to find those things like that, you've got to go to your local retailers, go kind of suss them out. Even sometimes, you know, take a turn to the local Indian restaurant and just holler back in the kitchen and say, hey, yeah, they this is what I need. Can you help me out? It's a good idea. All right, let's move on to headline number three. This is uh, from Modern Chipper. Brian Strait wrote that, wrote this one this morning. And with all the EV SPACs going on these days, it is quite hard to keep up. But Cohen, uh, the research firm, has initiated coverage of EV startup Arrival with an outperform rating and a price target that's more than $10 higher than its current share price of about 16 bucks. The authors of the Cohen note said they were constructive of Arrival's unique approach to production that leverages micro factories and vertical integration. Unlike most other vehicle manufacturers, Arrival plans to build loads of tiny micro factories across the world uh, produce, capable of producing roughly 10,000 vehicles per year rather than building massive plants uh, altogether. Arrival has plans for 33 micro factories globally with the first one in Charlotte, North Carolina that will be capable of supporting the 10,000 vehicle order from UPS. Mm -hmm. Cohen wrote that Arrival's approach is unlike the traditional automotive manufacturing that is linear, where output is often bottlenecked by the slowest processes in the manufacturing line. Arrival has plans for four vehicle platforms over the first of the next couple years, starting with buses later this year, followed by smaller vans and larger vans in 2022, and then a small vehicle platform in 2023. Cohen noted that the expected continued growth in e-commerce as the main factor that drives the demand for Arrival's vehicles. So I wonder also if some of that demand drive is going to come from the idea of President Biden really wanting to integrate those EVs into his infrastructure plan as well, specifically along the lines of those buses that he was talking about. You reminded me of my point that I lost earlier. <laughs> and the, the point was that, yes, they have come out with this say, make Buy American, Save American Jobs plan, but they've also come out and said that they're going to use best practices to make sure that they get the best prices, the most efficient modes. So there are people, uh, experts that are, that are weary of that. Those are kind of two conflicting plans that mm -hmm. you can't only, you can't buy American and also go for the most efficient processes right. because the most efficient processes typically happen outside of America. So that is something to watch. But Cohen and analysts uh, that are following Arrival, they believe that their, uh, their, their strategy of micro factories, smaller factories around the country, and being able to build you know, lower output from each factory is going to be beneficial to them long term. I'm sure Alan Adler will probably have some mm -hmm. thoughts on this when he comes up in the back half of the episode. So you mentioned this idea about micro factories. Give me a little bit about your opinion about what a micro factory can do for local jobs in an area, say, instead of like a massive, huge manufacturing facility? Well, it's obviously obviously going to produce fewer jobs than a large manufacturer, uh, a larger factory would, but these also have lower costs. They don't have to produce as many vehicles to, to stay uh, profitable and to stay operational, so they might have longer staying power for local communities. More longevity is the name of the game is what I'm hearing when you talk to me about that. <laughs> yes, I think so. And I like Arrival. They've, they've, um, they've had some major uh, announcements, but the UPS deal is by far their biggest, uh, 10,000 vehicles. It's going to take, as President Biden has said, there's, I think, 130,000 U.S. SPS vehicles that will also need to be um, converted over. There's 
tens of thousands of vehicles, uh, small delivery vehicles and large vehicles that will, be, um, that will be shifted over to electrification, not only in the private fleet, but in public sector fleets like UPS. Electrification is the name of the game. And checking in on LinkedIn, we've got Nico Brown saying that he thinks anyone doing EV or other alternative vehicles are going to shine over the next decade. And I think that that's something all of us here at Freight Waves are definitely holding on to is that idea that electrification is the way of the future. We're going to keep covering it. And you can find all of those headlines online at FreightWaves.com. Andrew, it's Tuesday. Uh, we've got Point of Sale airing tomorrow, and you dropped your newsletter, this, the first one for this week, right? That's right. I did uh, release Point of Sale yesterday, and I talked about this company called Herb Logistics that is trying to uh, solve the problem of grocery fulfillment in urban spaces mm. by building up because uh, real estate costs can be enormous when you're building fulfillment capacity in big cities. So, you know, building automated grocery fulfillment systems powered by little busy swarms of robots, that idea was science fiction just a few years ago, but now it is science and people are doing it. Here's a video of Herb Logistics, uh, 150 a foot high building, but it can be squeezed into a space as small as 1800 square foot. Wow. Uh, you know, it's very expensive to build these uh, to build these systems, and that's why Herb Logistics wants to build up. It's based in Boston. It plans on its first location there in the Boston Back Bay area, and it realized that when it was searching for parcels of land, it realized that they weren't going to be able to fill all of the goods that they needed to hold to create the store on that space. They mm -hmm. had to build up. Uh, so they have decided to go with that dual robot system that is very fast. It's like mini elevators buzzing vertically and horizontally, and it can retrieve 50 items in 135 seconds. Wow. That's the most efficient Amazon picker I've ever seen. <laughs> it is uh, It is very efficient. And they think that that's going to be their calling card, not only the, the, the efficiency, but the price that they're going to be able to charge. The current model is broken uh, mm -hmm. for online grocery fulfillment, really. And it doesn't work for groceries. Ra grocery is a notoriously razor-thin industry. I've got some estimates from Bain & Company that came out last year that really uh, that blew my mind. So in-store sales of groceries, they create an operating margin of between 2 and 4%. But when that translates to a BOPIS order where uh, customers are ordering online and those are being picked and packed by shoppers in store, that operating margin falls to negative 5%. There's wow. additional um, you know, labor cost and technology cost to go into that that is very difficult for the retailers to um, pass on to customers because it's such a highly competitive market. And then when that when that moves up to delivery, when you are delivering the goods and picking and packing, it's a negative 15% margin. So grocers want to cater to shoppers' preferences, but online sales are hurting the bottom line. So they are trying to find ways where they can automate as much as they can. And I think this vertical, uh, this verticality of this system is, is a nice twist. So my question about this, and I guess kind of an assumption I would make, is that as far as building vertical, you're talking about utilizing that skyscraper space, that true like vertical platform where you're not having to sit in a massive big box store that takes up acres and acres of land space, right? And we're talking more about people not returning to work from home and what people are going to be doing to utilize those corporate buildings. You know, residential real estate is off the charts. Corporate real estate is not necessarily following that same trend. Are people who utilize the system going to be looking at that corporate real estate, you know, companies that have gone completely work from home and now have high rises that are totally empty, converting those into this type of system? It's a good idea. Uh, CEO Cavallari said that uh, their system is best built when it is built on its own in a, in a, in a, in a new structure. Uh, they said that it's not best to be built onto an existing structure, structure like Walmart's local fulfillment centers. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe converting some of those buildings could be an option, but they didn't state that uh, at the beginning. Could be an interesting thing to watch and a good utilization of space in spaces that may remain empty now after the pandemic, right? <laughs> Yes, certainly. Um, <clears throat> most certainly. I just think in theory, uh, this, this plan is positioned well in a, in a time when I've said this ad nauseum. I think that BOPIS and uh, curbside pickup are going to be the winners long term because mm -hmm. of they are, they're free to customers and they really fit into the routine of the, Amer of the daily Americans. I think that BOPIS will, will work uh, long term and, and plans like these where people can swing in, order at a kiosk and have orders delivered in five minutes. It, it has some promise. Now, if only I can get a full bushel of bananas instead of just one banana when I order bananas, right? Right, and no bruising. <laughs> exactly right. Okay, so let's talk about, we've got a lot of new stuff hitting the Freight Waves airwaves here recently. Uh, you started your point, of show, your point of sale show in the last couple months, and that's not the only thing that we've got going on. I've got a new show uh, playing off of our Modern Shipper brand. That first episode actually drops today, and we're talking about drone delivery and the idea of drones taking packages into safe locations, putting them in a box, and then you're, you being able to retrieve your package like that instead of having to set it like in an apartment complex. And then, you know, there's a possibility of people coming in like rifling through your mail, of taking course. your packages. Pretty interesting interview that drops this afternoon. Uh, we've also got a new show with Bryce Brumlevy, and she's talking about, uh, it's called Cyberly, talking about the way of digitization and what it's like to exist in the cyberspace now. 
And our last new show, we've got something called Medically Necessary Aiming, and this airing, and this is all talking about the necessary, um, the necessariness, that's the word I'm really looking for, of the medical supply chain and kind of understanding how healthcare products get built and delivered to us, which is especially relevant in this time of COVID and our delivery of COVID vaccines. That's right. And that is one of our newest communities headed by Matt Bloy. He is one of our newest Freight Waves uh, writers and authors. He is fabulous, been writing about medical supply chains for more than a decade. So please tune in to that Medically Necessary, both the newsletter and the new show. Yep. That first episode aired last week of Medically Necessary, and he talked about the challenges of really scaling up COVID vaccine distribution to the way that it needs to be to pull us out of this pandemic. Yes, it's been an incredible haul. Uh, it does seem that the American companies and the, the worldwide companies as well, people in the companies in Germany and the UK have, have really come together. We're, we're pushing right along. We've had more than 100 million vaccines in the US uh, given out. So uh, the, the end is near. The end is near. The light is at the end of the tunnel. Let's throw it over to Nick Austin. Nick, we've got some weather going on. It is springtime. Any severe concerns here in the next few days? Hey, Kaylee, uh, nothing really widespread. We're not looking, I don't think, for any major tornado outbreaks, but you know, that outlook could always change, especially maybe later in the week, uh, but we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, some parts of the country are definitely going to get soaking wet uh, over the next uh, several days, while other parts of the country that are on, on, on drought conditions are going to stay very, very dry. So uh, kind of two ends of the spectrum there. But before we get into that, check out this really cool video. This is a dust devil out in Colorado from last weekend uh, near the Fort Collins area up in northeastern Colorado. Uh, these are really interesting uh, weather events here. It doesn't form the same way as a tornado. Uh, they often happen on clear days, like you see in the video. Uh, tornadoes will spin down out of thunderstorm clouds, but these actually develop from the ground up. So the warm air rises really quickly uh, on these bright sunny days in some parts of the country up into the very cold air aloft. And as that warm air kind of stretches out, it starts to spin and you get that little dust devil uh, forming. So pretty cool uh, phenomenon there. Uh, but we're not gonna really see that happening for the eastern half of the US. That's where all the rain is going to be over the next several days. So we'll go to sonar critical events. We'll check out the radar real quick. We do have snow in the high elevations of the Northern Rockies right now, and some scattered rain showers from parts of the plains over to the Great Lakes, but nothing major there. Nothing that most drivers aren't gonna be able to handle, but that system out west is going to slowly move uh, from the plains to the mid-Atlantic coast over the next several days. A lot of uh, periods of heavy rain and strong to severe thunderstorms in some spots, not going to be widespread, uh, and also from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf Coast. So basically covering the eastern half or so of the United States is where we're going to see uh, a pretty good amount of rainfall, and it's going to be heavy at times from uh, especially tomorrow through the weekend. So it's going to be a really slow moving system, which is why there's a kind of a threat for some localized flash flooding here and there, rainfall totals uh, by the end of the week in some areas where you see the red on the map could approach four inches, but I think uh, there could be certainly pockets of five, six, or even seven inches of total rainfall in some uh, isolated spots here and there. And that'll lead to localized flash flooding, a lot of wet roads for drivers out there. The potential always when you get uh, heavy rain like this and torrential rainfall from thunderstorms that there's going to be uh, maybe ramp and road closures here and there, hopefully not on any interstates, but you never know, drivers always have to be prepared for that. So, uh, but again, I don't think we're gonna see a major severe weather outbreak. It's mostly just gonna be heavy rain, the threat for flash flooding, but there will be kind of scattered areas where we'll see large hail and some thunderstorms producing some severe winds on the highways here and there, and uh, maybe some uh, tornadoes in some spots. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. Hopefully the outlook for that uh, won't get worse. And a little later in the show, we'll talk about where all the areas of the country that are gonna stay dry, where there's really an elevated risk for our wildfires continuing uh, over the next few days as well. And I'll have that coming up a little bit later. And Nick, before I let you go, I had to ask yeah. that, I think that's the first uh, dust devil, I think is what you called it. What kind of damage do those <laughs> things do? The th people seem to be really close to those. When you see those, should you run away from them? What kind of damage do they uh, do? Well, they don't really do much damage. I mean, they kick up dirt and dust and stuff, but uh, typically they're, they're very kind of narrow or you know rope-like in shape, like some tornadoes are, but uh, they don't last very long in most cases because once that warm air stretches all the way up to the cold air aloft, that cold air starts to filter in. Those things usually die out pretty quickly. I mean, I wouldn't want to get right next to it because you're going to get dirt and dust in your face. But, but generally, I don't think they do a whole lot of damage because they're pretty short-lived. Andrew, I'm going to give you a personal anecdote that you definitely <laughs> didn't ask for. But I grew up in New Mexico. 
running track on a dirt track in the middle of spring season, you would get a dust devil that just came straight through your track practice. And next thing you know, you've got shoes flying everywhere. And <laughs> it really doesn't do anything bad except put a lot of sand in your face. And then you're really not happy with, your, with yourself. <laughs> Man, uh, you know, I, I do sometimes wish that I had the warm weather of New Mexico, but no, I, I think I could avoid the dust devils. No, nah, you don't want the dust devils at all. Thanks, Nick. You bet. All, All right. right, what we got up next? We got Zach, Zach Strickland, Strickland coming up. He is going to give us a little bit of sonar insight. Uh, I believe he's going to tell us about freight volumes uh, on the spring break coast, on the Gulf Coast, how spring break volumes are affecting uh, the trucking industry. Zach, what do we have? Hey, guys. So uh, capacity continues to loosen this week. We saw the tender rejection rate fall under 26% for the first time since late February uh, just yesterday. Uh, not necessarily super unexpected. We saw this late month surge, uh, you know, with tender rejection rates jumping up close to peak level, uh, over 28% at the end of the month. This was probably due to the fact that we had the perfect storm uh, for shippers to really push a lot of freight there at the end of the month, end of the quarter. And then, of course, the Easter holiday, Good Friday happening last Last Friday uh, really does tend to motivate shippers to push a lot of freight uh, all at once to get out in front of that holiday period. Uh, we do expect this to you know happen at the beginning of April uh, traditionally, but also at, during this period of time where we do see demand a little bit contract during the week of Easter. A lot of spring breaks going on, beginning of the month, beginning of the quarter. All these things, of course, kind of reverse uh, course when we have these situations occur. So that's really what's happening right now in the aggregate section. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the market is contracting. Uh, one of the markets that is blowing up and it's one that we've talked about a little bit over the last month or so is the port of, or the market in Houston. And that's of course, right there next to the port of Houston. We think that a lot of this activity is derived from this imports, uh, you know, a lot of the imports coming in through these ports, uh, you know, in Savannah and New York, New Jersey, as we've talked about in the past. And of course, Houston is not immune to that as well. Uh, you know, volumes are very high out of Houston right now. Uh, tender rejection rates also uh, jumping up here over the last week or so. Uh, so, and that's that's really, you know, that right there along the Gulf Coast, we have seen a lot more activity here in the last week. Uh, and strangely, it's, you know, that's kind of the big hot spot of the market. Everywhere else is kind of in this sequential decline. Uh, we don't expect it to last very long. However, uh, you know, this is the week of Easter, uh, traditionally where we do see these volumes kind of slow down, but Houston uh, and areas along the Gulf Coast are the hot spots of the week. Thanks, Zach. Sounds like the Gulf Coast partiers are in Houston and not in South Padre Island as they would typically be for spring break, right, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, I, I was, you know, I was always a southeastern uh, Gulf Coast kind of spring break guy, even though I only went once. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely heard the the crazy tales of uh, South Padre Island, though. I've never been down there, and I've got to say, uh, it's really not a place that I would like to go. <laughs> yeah. If I'm going to go to the beach, I would prefer to go someplace with the nice, uh, like, beautiful crystal clear blue water, not the uh, murky water. Not the, the muddy Houston stuff? Coast. No, not at all. But yeah, Houston definitely been a uh, been a, bit benefic been a beneficiary of the port congestion on the mm -hmm. West Coast. We've seen the same thing in the port of Oakland. They've been a, a major uh, gainer of uh, of TEUs and of shipments just as shippers have tried to avoid the West, just try to avoid the Long Beach and, uh, and LA port complex. And so we talked a lot about that last week also with Lorianne LaRocco, and she was kind of talking to us about the idea to expect some of that port congestion to filter over to the East Coast as the unblockages were filtering out from what happened in the Suez Canal. Are you seeing anything about port congestion in the East Coast starting to pick up at all? Well, I've heard, I've heard um, mixed signals on the East Coast. So I've heard um, Henry Byers, our uh, maritime expert, he has said that he doesn't expect volumes to decline at all on the East Coast, given that there's already some, uh, there's already some ships waiting berth, not only in, in Savannah, but up the coast in Virginia and in New York, New Jersey. But he also expects there to be, yes, there's going to be some vessel bunching is something that he's worried about uh, as that Suez Canal continues to be unblocked and people, people, the, the ships make it through. We may have some ships arriving at the same time that were not planned to be there at the same time, creating further congestion on the East Coast. So we, sh we could see a little bit of the problems on the West Coast shifting over to the East Coast uh, for the time being over the next couple months. Where do you go with your freight? I don't know. There's not a place for it. <laughs> yeah, the thing is that it, it's just not a situation that's getting much better anymore, or any anytime soon. It seemed like we were on a path of, of small, a little bit of stability prior to the Suez Canal blocking. Mm -hmm. It was 
I, I kind of likened the, the ever given to the winter storms we had in the mm -hmm. U.S. It seems like both the global trade and domestic trade was finding a little bit of stability. We saw rejections falling. We saw volumes falling. Um, and then all of a sudden we had a disruption. We already had a very tight market. So any disruption that brought capacity off, offline has an, an outsized impact. We saw that with the ever given and we've also seen it with the winter storm. So we're just, it's gonna take some time to work through this. And so if you're an ocean carrier, you really need to figure out what the deal is and you really need to understand where you're going. And we've actually got our first guest online right now. He's the vice president of Root Advisory Services at Storm Geo, Rolf Rexton. He's here to talk about kind of optimization of fleets for carriers and ocean carriers and what it takes to kind of be the best ocean carrier that you can be. Rolf, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Kaylee. Thank you. Uh, just uh, briefly to introduce myself, uh, I've been in commercial shipping uh, since 1989, uh, mostly in the dry bulk segment uh, as an owner operator. But I've also been on the ship broking uh, side, the dark side, so to speak. Uh, with focus on business development and, uh, and stuff like that. So I'm not a meteorologist, uh, but I have been in, in Storm Geo for the last, uh, the last four years. So tell us a little bit the, about what Storm Geo is and what you guys do to help out fleets. Yeah, uh, our company is uh, Storm Geo is originally a, a weather routing company, uh, providing guidance uh, across uh, bodies of water uh, through, through, through the weather to optimize the speed, the ETA, the time used, etc., and of course the safety of the vessel and crew. Uh, today, uh, we are a fully integrated service provider uh, through what we call our S suite, which provides back end of the bridge planning and navigation, publication, compliance things to full fleet performance management services. All of these are complementary to the routing services, which is the the part of the business which I am uh, I am uh, I am uh, responsible for. So annually on the routing side, we route about 60 to 65,000 sea passengers, and we are definitely a dominant player in the market. Rolf, uh, carriers are facing some, some pressure to optimize their fuel consumption and reduce emissions. What is, what is Storm Geo doing to support this process? Well, we have, uh, we have throughout, the, throughout the, the ages and the decades, basically, been, been advising optimal routes uh, to vessels uh, along the way. This is uh, 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 <laughs> a part of the main business that we're in. We use uh, the globe, global ocean current models, et cetera, in the four day, three or four day forecast to, to, to calculate the impact that that will have on a vessel and the influence that it will have to optimize the, the, the vessel's uh, sailing path and get it there on the shortest time with the least, the least possible consumption. So this, in, in its its own way, has uh, has uh, has uh, it, it produces less emissions and less consumption. It's a more effective way of getting across the, the ocean. So you're looking at currently about a three to four day forecast for those ocean currents and trying to optimize where those vessels go based on what those currents look like. Talk to me a little bit about the idea of climate change and climate change shifting what standard ocean currents do. Is there any type of work that you guys are doing to, I guess, do long-term predictions for what ocean currents could look like in a changing climate? Uh, we don't we do not do too much of that. Call it strategic uh, forecasting, if you like, uh, the more long-term forecasting. That's more on an institutional level. Uh, the, obviously, climate change is, is very interesting in the longer term perspective, but it's not that interesting for a vessel that's actually underway, where the forecast for the next three to four days is more relevant and you have to make tactical decisions. So, I mean, we, 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 use, uh, we use the global ocean current model data to keep up to date with what the climate is doing right now. Okay, and how that's affecting the ocean currents. And we use the sea surface temperature, the salinity, and a bunch of other things to, to, to evaluate so that we understand what, what, what's, what's going on now and how that will affect the vessel that's on route to make this is tactical decisions at all. Rolf, has the pandemic accelerated the process of shipping lines adopting digitization? Uh, well, I think digitization has been there all along. It's it's not it's not it's not something that the pandemic invented. I think uh, cross cooperation uh, uh, certainly been has continued with force. Uh, the playing field in terms of getting information out there and discussion is very level. Uh, a lot of sp small startups are able to get their their voice heard across with Teams and Zoom and all of these these technological uh, things. So I think you know there is there is it's it's fair to say that there is a great great deal of interest in digital solutions and technologies designed to improve safety and efficiency and stability yes 
but on on vessel routing there will always be the human element because you need that interaction between shore and the vessel to 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 actually achieve the goals of of uh, the most efficient sea passage so talk to me a little bit about some of the benefits that your clients have been have seen from this push for digitization and kind of where you guys hope to take that digitization in the future well, I think uh, decarbonization and, and, and specifically emissions reporting it such, uh, are such concrete goals that, uh, that everybody has, is living with today and, 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 uh, and, and adapting to. You've probably all seen the Sea Cargo Charter Initiative and all, all kinds of data sharing seem to be out there. But I think in terms of uh, what kind of services we are, are providing and, and, and support we're giving to that, it's the just-in-time uh, uh, shipping solutions where you, you, you eliminate the out, outdated dragster effect of, of the container vessels going as fast as they can at high speeds to the destination, then only to slow down uh, in order to arrive on time. So also by predicting the influence, then of course, of the weather and the ocean currents, we can optimize uh, this required speed needed to arrive there at the de desired time. And this greatly reduces the fuel consumption and emissions of the greenhouse gases. And this, in turn, uh, you know, improves the EEOI, the, the Energy Efficiency Operating Index, which is the measure of CO2 uh, per ton mile efficiency, which is what shippers uh, need to, to monitor and report to, 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 to reach their own targets. Right. And so you mentioned that idea of shippers benefiting from this. And you guys are more of a carrier focus. You provide data that's specifically for car carriers getting from point A to point B. Talk to me a little bit about that shipper benefit on the front side of things. Well, uh, the, the the master of the vessel knows knows more about what's going on on the vessel and and how to navigate the the the, 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 the current conditions. What they're not so good at is, uh, uh, like myself, they're not uh, meteorologists and not so good at forecasting. So our our ability to give them accurate information as to how to potentially like our strategic power routing as to how to, to manage their vessel's RPM settings to keep a constant power uh, through the next uh, the next the days in the forecast, it enables them to operate the vessel much, much more efficiently in ensuring a constant fuel flow, which is, uh, which is the ultimate goal. The less fuel you use, the less emissions you have. Awesome, Rolf. Well, thank you for joining us so much today. Um, if people want to check out Storm Geo or want to hear more a little bit about what you guys do, where should we send them? stormgeo.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Interesting. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. I mean, you really have to think about that. When you're an ocean carrier, you really need to understand how are the currents. It's almost like flying an airplane, right? When you hit that ideal altitude and you catch that tailwind, it's going to take you quicker. But if you're fighting a headwind, if you're fighting a head ocean current, it's going to increase your shipping time. Yeah, it's certainly something I've never thought about, uh, <laughs> but it's, I can imagine it being a huge thing. I, I grew up watching NASCAR, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. always trying to get behind uh, the lead driver so you can tail them and get, a, get around them. It's similar to that. You're just using natural forces in the current to uh, make yourself more efficient and use, it just, it makes so much, makes so much sense to use the ocean to our favor, to mm -hmm. reduce emissions, reduce fuel costs. It, it all makes so much sense. Exactly. And so what's, I'm going to give you a little bit of a meteorology lesson here. Okay. Let's get it. So basically the earth uh, works in several circulations and it's always an air ocean kind of cooperation, right? And warmer sea surface temperatures drive air and it drives the circulation of the air. And that can actually influence how quickly ocean currents move. And specifically from Asia to the United States, there's a current that a lot of vessels will hop on and it's like catching that tailwind and it's going to help increase those times to get from point a to point b and so it is super super important because you know if you're a shipper and you're asking what time or when do i need to have a truck there to pick up this freight it's got to, you've got to have a good forecast on if that vessel is going to sit in that current or not, or if it's going to be fighting something else. Uh, Especially on given a time like now where there's mm -hmm. so many disruptions at every level of the supply chain, either from Chinese ports to you know container space to space on the ship uh, to drayage space, when there's so many disruptions and time and, and things that can expand the time that it takes for a good to get from China to the U.S., it's very important to know exactly how long it will take on the ocean. You know, Knowing mm -hmm. precisely uh, those type of uh, durations can help you plan for the long haul. It's going to be really interesting going back to that question about climate change and the shift in ocean currents to see what research comes out in the, uh, the meteorological and ocean oceanography, oceanographical. I know. I know, you, I know you were hoping for an answer on that one. <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll have to talk to one of those institutional uh, researchers that he was speaking of mm -hmm. to give us some more insight on how climate change will eventually affect the flow of trade. Because, of course, climate change is going to impact everything from our flow of trade.
at some point in time. Yeah, no, no doubt. All right, so uh, do we have, Al, I think we got Alan Adler up next, our think, Detroit Bureau Chief. He's going to be talking all the, the, the stuff that he's been writing over the past few days on mm -hmm. Class 8 truck orders and on Trevor Milton. There is Adlin there. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm great. How you guys doing? Doing pretty good today. Thank you for joining us on a little bit of a short notice. We got to you quick today. What's that again? So we got to you pretty quick today. Thank you for joining off so yeah. quickly for us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm a little early, but that's fine. <laughs> that's um, fine. So what would you guys like to talk about? We've got a lot. So let's start off with uh, the March report on Class 8 truck orders. Yeah, what a surprise. Not, no, not a surprise at all. You know, six straight months <laughs> now, we've got uh, over 40,000 orders uh, in the bank. And what's interesting, and really for the last couple of months, everything that gets added is just falling farther and farther down the line in terms of what can be done as far as, um, uh, you know, getting them built. Uh, we're out into early 2022 now for most of these builds um, because there's just no room. You've got both a huge order backlog, which is as big as it's been since uh, early 2019. And then you also have a whole bunch of problems in the supply chain. Uh, semiconductors is one, but you've also got uh, some other things that, uh, especially as, as the demand grows, that are getting harder to find on a, on a timely basis. So you've got some issues out there. It's not just affecting uh, the tractors, the Class 8 tractors, it's also affecting uh, trailers. Um, I had an interesting conversation with, uh, with Sean Kenny from uh, Hyundai Translate. They're the biggest uh, dry van maker uh, last week. And he was saying, you know, he said, I've been, I've been through times where we've had supply shortages and I've been through times where prices are going up. He said, but I've never seen all this at one time. And in Truck Talk last week, we, we put all that under a heading of imperfect storm because it really is. Alan, I know that uh, the orders have been ridiculous the last six months, up above 40,000, but do you have any insight into deliveries data? That seems to be what everybody is wanting. We're talking about all these crazy orders, but the backlog keeps growing. When can we expect to see some of this uh, new equipment hitting the market? What do deliveries look like uh, in, the, in the first three months of the year? Well, it's uh, obviously those that can be built are being built, but you've got a lot of uh, a lot of trucks right now. You've got uh, Dimeware taking rolling down time, for example, uh, on a couple of medium duty uh, truck plants in, in North Carolina and in Mexico. And their strategy is to sort of redirect the chips that they do get into the more profitable uh, class eight trucks. So so there are some deliveries. Uh, I, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I will tell you that. You've got almost a almost a ten month backlog building, you know, uh, the, the new trucks. And of course, if we do get more semiconductors, uh, it, you know, in a couple of months, that will ease a little bit. Um, but there are definite uh, definite backlogs that are are you know really not manageable right now. One of the things, Zach, that's happening is that uh, uh, things are moving down through. Did I say something wrong? No, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. One of the things one of the things that's happening is that. Uh, these fleets that can't get new trucks right now are going into the used market. And because we've got a good number of newer used uh, trucks coming in that have this uh, sort of newer safety equipment, uh, they're okay buying those uh, or, or, you know, arranging to get those in, in the place of the new, the new equipment. Um, but we definitely, um, we definitely have some uh, tough times to work through. I think that the reason that people continue to order, even though they know they can't get them is, they want to get whatever build slots are available, and and if you're talking about, say, a, a, a not a not a dry van and maybe not a, re, a refrigerated van or a reefer, uh, but you want something for flatbed, uh, you know, you can get that. Uh, you can still probably find some slots this year. Hey, Alan, I just one last question on this before we switch gears to uh, Nicola and Trevor Milton. Speaking of the build slots, is there any disincentive to go ahead and trying to locking up those spots? Do they have? Do they pay any type of fee if they cancel those down the road? No, isn't that amazing? They don't have to do that. And, and the industry, this is one of those sort of trucking industry anomalies, I think, is that is that they can put those slots in and pull them back, retime them for another time if they don't want them. We saw this happen a lot in 2018, the last time we had this big surge in orders. Um, and, and then you you start watching for the cancellations. And, and no, there's no penalty. Wow. Wow. Dang. I know you want to move on to Trevor Milton. I do have, I've got a question okay. for you, Alan, about this. So talk to me a little bit about the human capital as far as the manufacturing goes. As people are getting vaccinated and people are starting to come back online with more in-person manufacturing jobs, is that something that these manufacturers are having to look at and factor in as to what their production schedules look like? 
Well, I think I think their schedules uh, are, are pretty much maxed out. It's much more driven, uh, Kaylee, by the uh, by what's available in terms of uh, in, in terms of parts and and what they can build with. Obviously, uh, these guys a, a year ago were going through the kind of stuff that that they had to do to get the uh, 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 to get the plant safe for occupancy and and you know to put in all of the PPE and the things that were necessary to uh, safely run the plants. Now that that's happened, um, you know, there, there are more people obviously returning to the workforce. I think uh, our colleague, John Kingston, you know, watches pretty carefully the monthly uh, jobs reports in, in, you know, trucking, warehousing. And uh, so, so there have been, uh, you know, some hires, there's been some difficulty. I know at the trailer level of, of finding enough people to, to fill shifts, uh, but that should ease as the, as the pandemic effects uh, begin to lessen with more vaccinations. Sounds like we're heading in the right direction then. All right, Trevor Milton. Let's yes, hear it. Alan, uh, America's, or uh, the transportation's favorite person to hate on. Tell us what the newest news is. I think he offloaded some of his shares. He, he did. It wasn't a huge amount of shares. It was about three and a half million. But if you've got, you know, more than 80 million, that, that's not a big number. Um, it, it's interesting. Yesterday, the Barons reported that there was something a little unusual about the stock. So we did not report this and we really couldn't find anything about it. Not sure it matters much because, you know, what he got was basically $49 million for the shares, sold it a little bit under $14 a share. Um, But what's interesting, instead it was done as a a barter deal. Uh, He may have had uh, someone that he wanted to get something from. I have no idea. We haven't obviously heard from Trevor in quite some time. I mean, he's got the uh, the, sort of the the cloud of investigation uh, over him right now because of some of his remarks and statements uh, at, at, at during his time. Um, he's got federal investigations, both from the SEC and from the uh, Justice Department, uh, or at least the Southern District of New York. And he's, got, you know, we're waiting to see what happens there. Um, you know, Nicola did its own internal uh, study or internal investigation with a law firm, uh, Kirkland and Ellis, that found out that, yeah, there's at least nine things that he said that were either partially or wholly untrue when he said them. So, you know, I think in that sense, you know, Nicholas is doing his very best to get beyond Trevor. But every time, you know, he gets in the news, they get written about again. And, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. Um, there was a, a bit of a sell-off yesterday in Nicola, uh, which is, I think, something that, you know, may or may not have something to do with his barter sale. I don't know. Um, you know, Nicola, I've talked to Mark Russell, the current CEO, recently, as recently as last week. And I think they're just trying their hardest to, to forge ahead on the, uh, you know, on the um, – on the uh, building these electric uh, tray uh, trucks that are coming over from Germany and and getting those tested. Um, So I think they're trying real hard, but it is hard to get uh, uh, away from Trevor. All right, Alan, before I let you go, is there anything we can expect from Nikola over the next few months? Have they made any forward-looking statements? Can we expect any product launches or anything to, to hit the market? Uh, well, I think I think you know they're still very much in testing stage, both on the electric battery electric trucks. And I did learn last week, though, uh, during a, during a visit out there, that uh, uh, that they do expect to build nine or ten fuel cell trucks this year. Now, the only confirmed contract they have right now is with Anheuser Busch. They've uh, signed on uh, to to take some fuel cell trucks, um, but the head of uh, fuel cells tells me that they're going to do eight or ten of those this year. Which is kind of surprising, and and I think you know it was news to me at least. Awesome, Alan. Thanks. Give us a little rundown. What do you have airing next up on Freight Waves? What are you working on right now that our uh, viewers can go and check out? Well, um, just today uh, we were spending some time with Kenworth last week. Uh, whether they needed it or not, for the first time in 30 years, uh, Kenworth updated its medium duty truck lineup, and uh, so you've got a, a piece up there today on that. Uh, watch later this week for uh, some more. Uh, we s- saw some news this morning that has really dro- driven uh, Romeo uh, Technologies, battery uh, making company, uh, much higher. Uh, they picked up a deal with uh, with uh, with Packard to do the electric uh, battery packs for both the uh, Model 579, which is their flagship Class 8 truck, as well as the 520. So that's a that's a big deal for Romeo, which has been getting hammered. Uh, along with most of the electric uh, vehicle stocks in the last few weeks. Um, so they're up about, I don't know, 28, 29% right now. Awesome, Alan. Thanks. If you guys want to check out his stuff, go ahead and search him up on FreightWaves.com. Also check out Truck Talk airs on Fridays. Thanks for joining us today, Alan. Thanks very much, guys. 
Yeah, he's right about EV stocks getting smashed over mm -hmm. the past few weeks. That's been one of the biggest, uh, <laughs> biggest places of soreness in the market, given the sell-off that we've had. The EV SPACs and pretty much all the SPACs have gotten waxed. I mean, we heard about Zach Strickland talking to us about the market earlier. We're a little bit out of order today, and we, we have Anthony Smith back in the studio for us today. And uh, according to production, it's time for Ask Anthony Anything. Is that a new segment that we're working on today? Oh, it must be. We've got to give, give him a tough one. Anthony, um, what is your favorite color of M&M? The green one. The green one tastes <laughs> the best. <laughs> there you go. That wasn't a tough one. Andrew, yeah. what have you got for him? Very easy. I will give you a, an on-brand question here. I know we've got job openings data that you are just so excited to share with us. So tell us uh, what we see in the newest job openings data. That's right, Andrew. We have some jobs numbers. And as you all may know, Kaylee especially, I have some skepticism around all these numbers. But it seems like things are moving in the right direction. So when we're looking at the numbers overall, we usually look at initial jobs claims, which come out every Thursday, continuing claims around that. But they have job openings, so it just got released, and that shows that there was a 7.3 million report for job openings for the latest month. So that's something significant. And I'm not going to be looking at the specific numbers, but I'm going to be looking at the movements of those numbers. So when we're looking at initial claims or continuing claims, which are starting to come back down and moving in the right direction. We're seeing unemployment moving downwards subtly, but surely we're seeing the other factors for ADP employment looking like it's moving in the right direction, I start looking at the direction of movements. And I think that's going to be the most important thing when we're looking at these numbers. Not so much to get caught up in what's moving at how much, but how the, what's the direction for these movements. And so right now, it looks like we are moving in the right direction. Anthony, we had an absolute gangbuster jobs report in March, added uh, over 900,000 jobs. Why are you skeptical? So I was skeptical initially with all the jobs numbers because it seems like we had misclassifications on certain reports. We had uh, fraud attempts or systems not really capable of really counting the amount of jobless claims that came in. So really, it kind of seemed like there was a lot going on, a lot of numbers being thrown at the system, and a lot of uncertainty as to where we really were in the employment scene. Now, my skepticism is alleviating somewhat because we are seeing reports moving in the right direction on multiple fronts. So that does help a little bit more. It also helps that we are seeing that vaccine efforts are being seemingly effective. And that's also evidenced by the ISM services report, which you see that is also moving in the right direction overall. And so all this put together kind of summarizes to a, a, a more positive outlook for now. Anthony, I don't know if you caught our first headline from earlier today, but we were talking about how trucking jobs are accounting for about 20% of Biden's infrastructure plan. Talk to us a little bit about your opinion on where you or how you think those jobs are going to be filled and if that's going to impact any of those jobless claims at all. I think it's going to be a huge deal, especially with those jobless claims or potential folks looking for more employment. But it's funny when we look at the overall movement of the economy, we also have to know that the freight and transportation network itself moves at a, different, at, at a different pace. So throughout this time of cyclical recession, throughout the pandemic, the recession of the pandemic, we saw that transportation was absolutely booming. And so this is gonna just add more resources to something that's gonna be growing so much more in the future. We've seen the need for more transportation professionals around e-commerce, warehouse, and things like that. So there's only gonna to need to be more and more resources as we build out this infrastructure. So that's definitely gonna be an area of growth and it's going to be uh, a, a reason why freight waves here is going to be so important to kind of watch and keep up to date on the latest breaking news and the latest trends within the industry. Great plug there, Anthony. Thank yeah, you fantastic, Anthony. Couldn't have got better there. Uh, one last question before I let you go. The ISM PMI came out, I think, last week up above 64, just indicating massive growth for the uh, manufacturing sector, something to be watching. How about the ISM services index? I think that came out as well. That's right, Andrew. So last week we did have the ISM PMI showed a lot of growth continuously. And it's weird that not a lot of people are still talking about that prices thing, but we're gonna talk about the services side and the services side is increasing. We saw that there was around an eight point percentage point increase for the overall services side. So that does show that there is some growth as more businesses open up and that we see that vaccine efforts have been successful seemingly. So that's a positive sign. And when we look across the board at all the different breakouts, we see that that's also showing growth across the board. So a lot of positivity showing that we're moving in the right direction. And that kind of gives me a little bit less skepticism around some of these employment numbers that we've been seeing as of late with the um, unemployment rates, uh, the jobless claims, or continuing claims, I should say, 
and some of the other measurements. So all of this kind of moving into one unit, one piece, makes me a little bit more optimistic for the time being. That's a phrase I did not expect to ever hear Anthony Smith say, <laughs> optimism about the state of the markets. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with him, though. I got to say, when I look at the Bank of America data, which I watch very closely, we, we cover it on uh, Great Quarter Guys and on Point of Sale as well, the Bank of America data is showing that Americans are beginning to revert back to some service spending. It's happening at the lowest level, happening at restaurants right now. Americans are paring back uh, spending at grocery stores, ramping up grocery or at, at restaurant spending. On their, week, on their latest week of data, uh, restaurant spending was up mid-single digits over 2019, so full recovery uh, in, the, in the latest week of data, which is amazing for the service the sector, uh, amazing for the economy in general. Anthony, thank you so much. You can catch your healthy dose of Anthony Smith skepticism uh, on Freightonomics. <laughs> That's right, every, every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. And the great thing is, is that Zach Strickland kind of balances them out, I feel like. They're, he's they're really he's good optimistic, duo. but he's also quite skeptic. So uh, you're going to get a healthy dose of skepticism when you watch Freightonomics, which is good because uh, right now there's a lot of good signs coming out of the data. The mm -hmm. economy seems to be roaring. Uh, I'm seeing Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. They're saying that their 6 7% real GDP growth rates might be too low given the rate wow. of uh, acceleration right now happening on all sectors of the economy. The manufacturing sector is, is uh, recovering very quickly. The consumer sector is roaring, aided by the, the government stimulus in the latest week of that Bank of America data. Consumer spending was up 20% over 2019. That is just unbelievable numbers. And, and they're just carrying the economy. But then we've also got a white hot housing market uh, and, and everything seems to be just firing on all cylinders right now, which is great news, but you need some skepticism in your life. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot really quick, Andrew. Go for it. So Q1 ended, what was it, six, six days ago. And back in January, you and Seth made your predictions about what you expected 2021 to look like and on your uh, Great Quarter Guys show. So talk to me a little bit about what you thought about Q1 and if it's living up to your expectations or not. Well, the consumer spending has exceeded my expectations because I hadn't factored in as big of a uh, second stimulus that we got mm -hmm. in 2021. Uh, so that, that second stimulus has kind of blown all of my expectations out of the water. Uh, my and Seth's belief was that we're going to see this, you know, quick reversion back to services when the economy reopens. We believe that there's a generational uh, pent up demand for services. And I think that that still is going to be here. I think people are itching to go out on vacation, go out to concerts, go out to movies and everything. But what has changed is I think that the consumer balance sheet is strong enough to withstand that reversion back to services without the detriment to goods. So I think that good spending can continue to stay strong throughout the year while services spending picks up in the back half of the year. That is a definite big change that I've had over the last couple of weeks. We've talked a lot on this show and all of our shows really about that consumer spending focused on that goods and people using that stimulus money not necessarily to pay down debt or anything like that, but really put it back into the economy, which was kind of the whole point of a stimulus check. You know, it's an economic stimulus bill. You want to filter that money back in. Looks like the consumers were doing that. Yeah, the consumers have done their best. Uh, one thing that we've all learned over the past year that been affirmed is not to doubt the American consumer, especially <laughs> uh, with free money from the government. Nick, <laughs> let's bring Nick Austin back in for our last weather hit of the day. What's up with wildfires in the Southwest, Nick? Well, you know, they're popping up in a lot of spots. Uh, a lot of them are under control, but the winds are still uh, pretty breezy out there. So there's always that risk that existing fires, any new fires that pop up are going to spray quickly. Um, it can really, uh, happen, there's really a high risk for that with uh, not just severe drought, but even exceptional drought in parts of the Southwest. That's the worst category that is issued by the U.S. Drought Monitor. So let's get right to it. So in our critical events, and we'll show you where the areas that are uh, going to be most at risk for these uh, fires possibly getting out of control because winds are going to be gusting uh, in excess of 50 or 60 miles per hour in parts of the Four Corners region across the desert Southwest. All these areas that are uh, shaded in this yellow color here. So even eastern Utah, across southern Colorado, almost all of New Mexico, west Texas, down in the southeastern Arizona, just bone dry. And it's going to stay that way uh, likely all week. Now, the good thing is that the winds after today will probably die down. So there's at least less of a threat that any fires out there existing or new will spread really quickly. But that threat is out there today. And anytime that happens and that smoke starts to blow across major highways, there's always potential for road closures that happened on I-94 in North Dakota last uh, Friday. Uh, they had to shut down about a 40 mile stretch of that highway in the western part of the state because of a quickly spreading fire. And that smoke got really thick and was just uh, the winds were blowing it right across the highway. So, but this is the part of the country where I think areas will be most at risk. And if you take a look at the uh, forecast for the 
uh, rainfall over the next week, uh, it's just going to be bone dry. There's hardly going to be even a drop of rain out there. And that's unfortunate. Uh, they really, really need it. Not just in the desert southwest, other parts of the western U.S. Uh, are also under drought conditions at varying levels too. But this is the region of the country uh, that is probably the driest and where the winds are also going to be the strongest. So that adds that uh, additional level of risk as far as the wildfires um, spreading really quickly. So hopefully they'll get some rain soon, but all the rain over the next several days is going to be mainly across the eastern half of the U.S. Awesome, Nick. And you're talking about those high winds. Talk to us a little bit about high wind troubles on those highways across the southeast and what that can mean for truckers driving through those areas the next couple of days. Yeah, well, really from tomorrow all the way through the weekend, the eastern half of the U.S., there's going to be a lot of wet roads uh, periods of heavy rain, some strong and severe thunderstorms here and there, so there'll be spots of hail, uh, severe crosswinds on some highways, not widespread severe outbreak, but there'll be some tornadoes here and there as well. But I mean, anywhere from Texas to the Dakotas, all the way to the Gulf Coast, the Mid-Atlantic, Great Lakes, there's going to be periods of uh, that heavy rain, torrential rain at times, and just a lot of wet highways out there. And it's a slow moving system, so that threat is going to be out there, uh, mainly beginning tomorrow, but lasting all the way uh, through Saturday, maybe even Sunday. It could be uh, till the end of the week before a lot of those areas get a break. Definitely got to stay weather aware for the next couple of days. Certainly. All right, Nick, thank you so much for the insights. Looking forward to, uh, to more of you this week. All right, what's, what else are you looking forward to this week? I believe we've got a huge event coming up I tomorrow. I was going to say, speaking of the next couple of days, tomorrow marks uh, our first virtual event of April. We've got the Enterprise Fleet Summit. And we're talking about successful fleet managers. They're always looking for ways to grow the business, whether customer base, profit margins, or industry network and fleet size. So we're going to look at the competitive nature of trucking fleets and uh, how you can succeed best and grow your network in the best way possible. That's right. And as, as with always uh, in our Freightways virtual events, it's a huge lineup. We've got a keynote by Andrew Leto. He's the CEO of Emerge. He's going to be talking about LTL optimism in the current market. I believe he'll probably talk about how e-commerce is playing into the LTL markets. Uh, this is something I wrote about in Point of Sale yesterday. Mm -hmm. LTL is a huge beneficiary of this e-commerce boom, not only delivering to homes, but also shipping to stores. Bopus ship from store. It's creating smaller uh, shipment quantities, which is really benefiting LTL. So Andrew Leto will be speaking with our own George Abernathy tomorrow morning for the keynote. And then talk about talk to me a little bit about what you guys talked about on Great Quarter Guys for tomorrow. That's right. Seth Holm and I spoke with Tom Wadowitz, who is one of the best transportation analysts in the biz. Uh, we basically just talked about the trucking cycle, where we are, where you should be playing your money if you were to be investing in the trucking uh, industry. He talks about some of the names that he's most favoring over the next couple months and why. Uh, he's very bullish on LTL, uh, <laughs> as, as I just mentioned, and also the brokerage space with uh, with contract rates moving up and spot rates, not so much pressure on them right now, but amazing there. Check out Tom Wadowitz, Seth and I uh, at I think about 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Seems to be a common theme. We've got, we will have Kevin Hill with the Put That Coffee Down episode. We've got Dooner and the Dude, once again with a full slate of What the Truck guests. You guys weren't there for the last virtual event that we had. They did What the, what the Truck Speed Dating was what I called it because they had like eight guests on What the Truck. They have about four lined up for tomorrow, so it's definitely something worth watching tomorrow. And yeah, we're also going to have Ellen Voy, who I'm very excited about. She is the president and CEO of the Women in Trucking Association. She's going to be speaking about women in trucking. Uh, this is one of the one of my big points of emphasis that we did last year at one of the events. We spoke about uh, driver recruiting and the problems we have with shortages in the industry. And uh, I look at the industry and I see that it's still like 95% male. So I think that uh, women could be a source uh, of, of growth in this industry and they need to be looked at um, more, more importantly. Absolutely. That's all the slate for tomorrow. Looking ahead to the rest of the spring, we've got the Net Zero Carbon Summit coming up Thursday, April 22nd. We've got Drone Waves Summit coming up on Friday, April 30th. So those, that eight-day space is going to be very, very interesting. And then after that, we are uh, back again to Freight Waves Live at Home. And last week, I was telling Michael Vincent, it feels like we just had Freight Waves Live at Home. And now here we are again getting ready for another incredible virtual event. Yeah, you're telling me. I feel like we just did Freight Waves Live at Home in May, uh, like yesterday. Then we did Freight Waves Live at Home in November. That, that seems like this morning. So mm -hmm. it's been nuts. We're also going to announce the Freight Wave Shipper of Choice at yeah. the uh, Freight Waves Live at Home event, which I've been heavily involved in. I'm very excited to release those to you. And then after that, we've got Owner Operator Summit coming Wednesday, June 9th. Cybersecurity Summit coming in June 23rd. And then everybody's talking about it. Michael Vincent calls it the Coachella of Freight, the Future <laughs> of Freight Festival F3 coming in the second week of November this yeah, year. I think I'd prefer the Bonnaroo of, uh, of freight. Are Just you going? Simply, going? Of course I'll be there. I'm a Bonnaroo person. But that's been all we've got uh, for Midday Market Update today, Tuesday, April 6th. 
We'll see you again next week and join us tomorrow for the Fleet Enterprise Summit. See you then.